Well, good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. Time to begin our class, and we're going to look at the questions on um, Acts chapter 26, and then start in talking a little bit about Acts chapter 27 here in a minute. <clears throat> Acts chapter 26, a very interesting chapter in that... Um, Paul is presenting his case, having presented his case to Festus, who is the new governor or procurator of Judea, or Palestine, if you will, uh, appointed by Rome. Uh, and he's running into the same problem that uh, Lysias ran into when he was trying to send Paul to Felix. He wasn't really quite sure what to accuse him of that would justify him being heard by a Roman official. And now Festus is going to be perplexed as to what to write to Caesar because Paul has already uh, appealed to Caesar. And the reason he appealed to Caesar was what, as you recall? What, what was it that prompted Paul to say, well, I'm just going to appeal to Caesar. Yes. So that was the whole problem in the first place. The Jews had plotted to kill Paul. In fact, 40 would-be assassins had already organized a plot to kill him uh, by bringing him back into second hearing uh, there in uh, Jerusalem before Lysias. And uh, Paul's nephew uh, alerted um, Lysias of this plot, and so he had Paul transported under Roman guard, uh, some 400 plus men uh, escorted Paul to Caesarea to be heard by Felix. Lysias, of course, sending a letter, uh, dressing up a little bit his involvement in the case, um, leaving out some key components <laughs> that might have gotten him into trouble. Uh, but anyway, be that as it may, uh, uh, Felix, of course, heard him and left him under house arrest for some two years until he left office and left him for Festus to deal with. And so Festus um, heard him, and, and since he was being accused by the Jews of violating some sort of Jewish religious law, as Festus saw it, uh, he just asked Paul, well, be all right if we just took you back to Jerusalem to be tried and heard there. And of course, Paul knew what would happen if that would be the case, that they'd try to kill him again. And so he said, No, that's the way it's going to be. I'll just appeal to Caesar. So now we have the situation where Paul is going to be before Agrippa. And I gave you this uh, little chart of the genealogical chart of the Herodian dynasty. And we might look at that in just a minute. Because we read about Herod over and over again in the New Testament. It's always confusing which Herod we're talking about and how they play into the story. But if you look at the bottom of the chart here, the Herod that we're talking about is Herod Agrippa II. And if you'll notice there, uh, Herod Agrippa II being the son of Herod Agrippa I, he had two siblings. One is Bernanese, as it would be in the uh, Roman way of speaking, we would call her Bernice, and Drusilla. Well, we've already run into Drusilla once before. Who is she? The wife of who? Felix. Yeah, it was Felix's wife. So Felix was Herod Agrippa's, the first son-in-law. See how all this gets, I told you last week, it's kind of like a Peyton play situation. Everybody is interconnected with everybody else and all these behind the scenes uh, drama relationships that are in existence. Well, anyway, Drusilla was the wife of Felix, but she was also the sister of Herod Agrippa II, before whom Paul is going to be presenting his case. Now, you also notice that 
this Bernice or Bernice was also the sister of Herod Agrippa II. And if you notice in Acts chapter 25 and verse 13, well, let's just read 12 and 13. Someone read Acts 25, verses 12 and 13. Okay, <clears throat> so you might think Bernice is Herod Agrippa II's wife. Well, she isn't. She's his sister. She was his consort, if you'd like to use a, an official term that the royals like to use today. She wasn't his sister, but she was his female companion. Now, the interesting thing about that is she, she was the widow of go all the way over to the left-hand side, Herod Chalcis. Herod Chalcis was the brother of Herod the Grip of the First. And when Herod the Grip of the First died, Agrippa the Second was only 17 years old. And he was thought too immature to be assuming his father's throne. And so the throne was transferred to Herod Agrippa the First's brother, who was Herod Chalcis, who served as Herod for a very short period of time, just a, a few years, and Bernice was married to him. Now, what seems odd about that relationship? From a physical standpoint. Yes, she was married to her uncle. See, I would hate to have seen what the DNA pool of the Herod family looked like. They had must have had all kinds of indwelling errors of metabolism and cancers, and there's no telling what all of a medical, <laughs> they were a medical nightmare because of all this intermarrying that they did. So Bernice was married to her uncle. Her uncle passed away. And so now she is the consort of her brother, Herod Agrippa II. So when Herod and Bernice come to hear Paul's case, you have a brother-sister relationship going on there. Now, years later, Herod Agrippa II and Bernice uh, went to Rome. And while in Rome, Titus was the emperor. And it's thought by historians that Bernice actually became the companion and possibly even the wife of Titus before her ultimate death. And so the Herodian family had a lot of, of uh, secular relationships that aren't specifically or explicitly described in the scripture. But when you see these family relationships and then you read about them in the, in the scripture, knowing what the family relationships are, I think it sheds a little more light. Uh, on the situation. Now, another thing that's interesting to know that most people think that Herod Agrippa II was quite well versed in Jewish law. And, and you'll notice that uh, Paul, in the beginning of chapter 26, in verse 2, he says, I thank myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee touching all things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee or you to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. And that's an accurate statement, not necessarily because it's in the scripture, which it, it is, but historically Herod Agrippa II was thought to be quite knowledgeable in Jewish laws and Jewish customs, that's why Festus is asking him to hear Paul's case. Perhaps he will better understand what these charges are that are being brought against Paul because to Festus, they don't mean a thing to him. He knows nothing about Jewish law. He knows nothing about Jewish customs. All he, he's a Roman. And so far, he hasn't found anything that Paul has done that violates Roman law. But perhaps Agrippa could shed some light on the situation. So that's why he wanted 
Agrippa to hear the case. Okay. Any, any thoughts on any of that? Anybody want to chime in with some additional info that would shed some light on the situation? Agrippa the first. Uh, he's the one who killed James. He's the one who had James killed. Oh, that's Herod the Great. Oh, that was that was a long time ago. He, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what year. Well, we know that. It was probably, you know, Joseph and Mary fled to Egypt, right? And was told by the angel to remain there until Herod, all those who sought Jesus' life had died. And so they stayed there until Herod the Great did die, which would be sometime in the first decade, I don't know, 5 AD, 6 AD, 8 AD, I'm not sure what year it was, but somewhere along in there is when he would have Between one and four. <laughs> one to four BC. Oh, okay, all right. So Jesus was still a, a child when they came back out of Egypt, so it wasn't too long after. Uh, that brings up another point. You know, at quote unquote Christmas time, what do we always see at the manger scene? What? The wise men. Who else? The shepherds. Hmm? I'm talking about how, quote unquote, Christendom today views Christmas, not necessarily how the scripture reveals it. So you see the, the shepherds and the wise men. Who, who actually were at the manger scene? The shepherds. When did the wise men come? Hmm? How much later? How about two years later? When the wise men, at the instruction of the angel, deceived Herod and didn't come back to Herod to tell him where they found Jesus, what did Herod order? All male Jewish children under the age of two executed. According to the time, it says, is revealed by the wise men. So they, they came along. Jesus was a toddler when the wise men came. They were still in Bethlehem at the time, but they lived in a house. They weren't in a manger. And he was probably walking, <laughs> talking, <laughs> and all that. So the way all that's represented today is totally unscriptural. And I'm not sure why it's done that way, I guess, because it's always been done that way. But anyway, that's just another anomaly we run into. <laughs> man's, man's interpretation of what the Bible actually says being two different things. Okay, well, let's look at, um, which question did we get down to on page 26? Or did we answer all of them? Oh, we, we did? Okay. All right. Um, let's see if there's something else I wanted to mention in here. Well, just, just by way of review, as we get into the voyage to Rome, which actually starts in verse or in chapter 27, um, we mentioned there question 36 that Festus's thought was that the things that Paul was being accused of were something in violation of Jewish customs or laws. And then in question 37, what did Paul actually think? Well, what was 
as Paul begins his speech to uh, Agrippa, what does he say is the purpose of this defense he's about to give in Paul's own words? Standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. Okay. Yeah, he's he's going he's going to defend himself based on what the Old Testament scriptures has said regarding the Christ. And he's hoping that this will ring a bell with Agrippa, who has knowledge of these things. He apparently knows the Old Testament prophets. He knows who Moses was and the teachings of the law of Moses and the prophecies made by Moses and other of the prophets in the Old Testament concerning the Messiah. And he's going to, he actually in verse 2 he says he's going to, to answer for himself touching all the things where I am accused of the Jews. And we've, of course we've enumerated those in the past that he was desecrating the temple, he was stirring up uh, insurrection throughout the empire and turning people against the law of Moses and that sort of thing. And so, um, ultimately, how did Agrippa react to his speech? What was his? I'm sorry? Mm-hmm. Uh, here's another way to look at it. Of course, the, the word there is strange word translated almost in the King James and maybe short time in other translations. Literally means uh, something short, brief. That's all it means. And so, how you work that into a sentence in English is subject to a lot of interpretation. And so, some people think, well, you you almost convinced me to be a Christian. I've got you told me enough that I'm thinking about it, but not enough for me to actually do anything about it yet. That's kind of the way a lot of people look at it, and and we say we've got to go beyond what what Agrippa did and actually obey to actually respond positively. Uh, I read one commentator that seemed to think it's almost a, a, rhetor a rhetorical, sarcastic remark that he makes. Like, you expect me to believe in such a short period of time you're going to convince me to be a Christian? Have you ever heard that interpretation? That's about what the English standard says. Is that right? If it says, in a short time, would you persuade me? Yeah. You think in such a short time you're going to persuade me to be a Christian? And the reason a lot of people think that that's what was meant by that is the fact that Agrippa is what? He's a, he's a Jewish sort of ancestry, but what is he? What's his title? King. Who made him king? The Romans. Suppose he espouses Christianity. What might happen to him? He may not be king anymore. So Agrippa's conflicted at this point. I mean, he's he. No matter what decision he makes here, there's going to be consequences. Of course, not becoming a Christian, you know, it puts his soul in jeopardy. Even if his conscience says he should obey the gospel, he he is in the same situation that those leaders of the synagogue were in that we read about. Said so many believed in, in Christ, but what? That's right. They didn't commit themselves to serving Jesus, but they prayed they get kicked out of the synagogue. So Agrippa's kind of in the same situation that, that those folks were in. You know what's also interesting is that 
his father, his grandfather, his great grandfather have all been fighting against Christ all these years. It, it, it's a family legacy not to be a Christian, you know, and to be anti-Christ. I mean, their whole their whole existence has to be anti-Christ. Absolutely. So actually, his uh, his grandfather was Herod the Great, and of course, he tried to murder Christ. And so, becoming a Christian is not. He, I think he's telling Paul, academically, you can tell me all this stuff about how Christ is fulfilling Jewish prophecy, but there's no way I'm going to become a, a Christian because I've got too many other things that, to me, are more important in my life. I want to stay king, and I want to be in good terms with the Jews, I want to be in good terms with Caesar, and becoming a Christian would just mess all that up. So, that was kind of the situation we did. Yeah, so they, they didn't summarize, did they? They sure did. So anyway, as, as we leave chapter 26, uh, what's uh, Agrippa Festus' conclusion regarding Paul? If he hadn't appealed to Caesar, he'd be set free. Yeah. You think they were kind of glad that uh, he had appealed to Caesar? Exactly. I think if I was Festus and or Agrippa in this situation, I would be so tickled that Paul had appealed to Caesar because I really don't want to have to deal with this guy. Because anything I do, I'm going to have problems. If I say he's free, you know, then the Jews are probably going to try to kill him, and then I'm going to have to deal with that. If I keep him in prison, you know, the Jews are going to be still on my back. What are you going to do with this guy? You know, we're going to turn in a bad report about you and Caesar and I'll lose my job. I mean, it just... Hands-off policy is the safest course for both Agrippa and Festus at this point. And so, but I think they did realize that Paul was innocent. Just like who else recognized that a certain prisoner was innocent, but he couldn't deal with it. I'll just pile another Roman governor. Uh, Christianity created all kinds of problems for all the Roman governors that had to serve during this time. Yeah, I don't recognize Jesus had done anything worthy of death, but rather than doing the right thing, he wanted to please the people, and so he just turned him over to them. Basically, uh, Paul and Jesus, through the providence of God, is preserving Paul, and they say, you're going to go into Rome. He spoke in that sometime earlier, and he's preserving Paul at this time, so he is able to go to Rome, and one of the reasons he's able to go to Rome is because Paul is appealed to Caesar. This is all the plan of God that this has him this way. And so, uh, to Caesar he goes. Okay, then you have also chapter 26. I'm going to put a different uh, slide up here in just a minute so we can kind of see uh, where Paul was headed here. If I can find it. Okay. So this is a map of Paul's trip to Rome. taken is kind of dependent upon the kind of ship that he's in. Though these small ships had to stay close to the coastline, they weren't seaworthy like the large, I'll call them freight ship, ships that carried massive amounts of grain from Egypt and that sort of thing to roll. These are smaller ships, and so when he starts out here at uh, Caesarea and goes to Sidon, uh, it's the first stop, the ships that they take are small ships and they're staying close to the coastline until they get over here to Sinaitis and from that point they find a large ship that's on its way to Italy and I don't know if it says, I can't remember if it says in the scripture or one of the commentators suggested that it was a grain ship 
that carry passengers as well as cargo. And we know from the shipwreck over on Malta that there were like 276 people on board and they were all preserved. No one lost their life as Paul said they would. Uh, so ships back then carried both cargo and passengers and that was the kind of ship Paul was on. The ship of Alexandria. Yeah, the ship is port of Paul may have been Alexandria, Egypt actually, and it just happened to be maybe he took a shipment up to that area of Asia and then it was on its way from there to Rome. Steve, looking at that map, has it ever amazed you how small Jerusalem and Israel is relative to the world, yet this message came from that little small location and how it spread through a kingdom coming from such a very small geographical place? Right. When you studied, uh, when you studied world history in the 8th grade, or the ninth grade, whatever, whatever grade you had in world history, how much did you study about Israel? Not much. Okay, how much I said Start out here at Caesarea and we go 
the side. It says they were sailing around the backside of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And here they go by Cilicia. And here's Tarsus, Paul's hometown, right here. And then they kind of hugged the coast of Pamphylia, where they all and Barnabas stopped on their first missionary journey, and from where John Mark returned to Jerusalem, leaving them there in Pamphylia. We go over to Myra. And then Sinidus is kind of the, well, they said, my what was that other, um, the city of, oh, Myra City, Lysia. Okay, Lysia is the province of Myra. This is where they're going to, it says they changed to a grain ship uh, sailing to Italy at this point right here. So they're on a small ship coming around this way, hugging the coast, but on this at this port, they'll get on this large ship that's headed to Italy. Those Alan's translation said they were sailing to Rome. King James says we're sailing to Italy. I don't have some of your other translations that they all say Rome, except for King James, or some of your other say Italy. New American Standard says Italy. Says Italy. Pardon? Italy. Okay, so some of the translations say Italy, so say Rome, say same difference. Now, you notice in the first verse, Luke says, and when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, who's we? All the people that's with Paul, but Luke is there because he's part of the we. Right. Some say that only Luke was with him on this trip. Because there is darkness. Well, besides Aristarchus of Macedonia. So it's thought that Luke, Paul, and Aristarchus are the three that are on this ship that are headed to Rome. Uh, I'm not sure how accurate that is, but there are others whose names aren't revealed. So we're now at the port city of Myra, and they're going to be boarding this grain ship. So let's read. Uh, Verses uh, 6 through 12, or 6 through 11. No, well, 6 through 13, actually. 6 through 13. Sorry to read that for us. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with, with difficulty off Sneas, and as the wind did not allow us to go farther, we sailed under the lee of the creek off, off Salon. Coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Basia. Since much time had passed and the voyage was not dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but of also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship and to what Paul said. And because the cargo was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they would reached Phoenix, the harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spent the winter there. Now, when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete. Okay. Okay, very good. So, they're up here at uh, Myra, so they go over here to Sinidus. And then they start their trip to Italy. So one might say, why are they going down this way? Well, it's supposed to be like, they could just go like this. Looks like the wings were good. Yeah. You could just go wherever you wanted to go back in those days. You had, you had a sail on the ship. You had to go wherever the wind was taking you. And I guess maybe the currents of the Alan, you know about the currents in the Mediterranean Sea, and they spent some time there, and they run a certain direction, or? Well, they come down out of the 
Any other thoughts on those first uh, 13 verses? Well, the next section, uh, actually, verse 38 talks about the storm that they uh, come upon. So let's read verses uh, 14 through 21. Someone read those for us. But soon a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster uh, struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Kauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then, fearing that they would run aground on the Cyrus, they lowered the gear and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard. Their own hands, when neither when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us. All hope of our being saved was at last abandoned, since they had been without food for a long time. Paul stood up among them and said, "Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from from Crete and and cured this injury and loss." Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah, that word that uh, I wasn't familiar with that word that you read in the book was it? Uh, was 17. 17. Yeah. What was that? You should fall into the what? The undergird. Undergird. One word. What's your saying? What's it? Quicksand? <laughs> yeah, I like quicksand. <laughs> I yeah, I didn't know what that, I was reading it now. So that leads you to believe, you know, here they are, uh, I guess they're they're just kind of hugging the coast of Crete. So I assume from this, and Al might be able to shed some light on this for us, that there are a lot of areas where there's maybe sandbars and the Mediterranean Sea is not as deep in places as others. And there's risk of running the ground in some of these areas. That's fair. Yes, the sandbar sea, if you will, hold that. And the undoubtedly will run into some areas where we travel. Yeah. And maybe what we're doing. I've always been amazed at how they secured the ship. Well, let's say they did. Apparently, they ran lines. Yeah, or how they did that. <laughs> that seems kind of, maybe they uh, loop around around the bow of the ship and bring it back and cinch it up or something to keep the side caving in or whatever. Or maybe collapsing if they hit a sandbar or something like that. Well, see, the Atlantic Ocean's that way. We were down in the Caribbean and we went on a boat ride out to what they call Stingray City out in the middle of the ocean. We get out of the boat in the middle of the ocean, it's a like two foot deep of uh, two foot deep of water, and these stingrays are swimming around. Like, yeah, in a place like that, even you would think would be a very deep area, and you're just not very deep at all. So, uh, I guess they were running into problems like that. So they were throwing tackle out to light the ship so they wouldn't draw so much water and the sinks down in the water so much. And so, what's the last thing a captain wants to hear when he's having problems? What's Paul saying in verse 21? In your own words. I, you should have listened to me. I told you so. But can you just imagine how the captain must have reacted to that? That's not revealed in the scripture, but I would say if I was a captain, I didn't need to be reminded that I made the wrong decision when problems are occurring. But Paul, 
Paul told them, so you should have paid attention to it. told you not to leave free. And now I exhort you, says in verse 22, be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night in the angel of God, whose I am and who I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, then must be brought, you must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God has given you all them that sail with you. So, God, through an angel, has appeared to Paul and told him, don't worry, you're going to make it to Caesar, and everyone who's with you will be preserved as well. The ships don't be lost, but no lives will be lost. And so that was uh, words of encouragement for the captain and all the other passengers that were on board the ship. They all make it through the land safely, eventually. Not yet, but eventually. Okay. Um, we've got a few more minutes. Let's just read uh, 25 through uh, uh, 29. Somebody read 25 through 29 for us. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. We must run the ground on a certain island. But when the fourteenth night came, as they were being driven about in the Adriatic Sea, that midnight, about midnight the sailors began to surmise that they were approaching some land. They took certain soundings and found that there would be twenty fathoms. And a little farther, they said they took another sounding and found it to be fifteen fathoms. Fearing that they might run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. Okay. So as they're as they're out here kind of flailing around, they're considering this down here part of the here's the Adriatic Sea between Greece or Macedonia and Italy, and I guess it extends. I'm not sure what where the Adriatic ends and the Mediterranean begins, but they're calling this the Adriatic right in here. Um, that uh, they are finding that they're they are approaching land, and so they do some sounding, and they find that the first. Sounding that they do is 20 fathoms. So how how deep is that? How deep a fathom is? You have to know your Bible or anything. You know how much a fathom is? Mine says six feet. I don't know if that's right or not. So that'd be 120 feet. 20 fathoms. Well, it says 120 feet. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we can translate it that way. All right. And, uh, and then they got a little bit further and then they sounded again. And it was probably it was 15 fathoms, which would be about 90 feet. And then it says, very good. They should fall on the rocks. They cast forth four anchors out of the stern. And wish for the day. So we'll end there. And uh, whatever. Yeah.